Chapter Fifteen of A Diary from Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. A Diary from Dixie by Mary Chestnut. Chapter Fifteen. Camden, South Carolina, September tenth, eighteen sixty three to November five, eighteen sixty three. Camden, South Carolina, September tenth, eighteen sixty three. It is a comfort to turn from small political jealousies to our grand battles, to Lee and Kirby Smith after council and convention squabbles. Lee has proved to be all that my husband prophesied of him when he was so unpopular and when Joe Johnston was the great god of war. The very sound of the word convention or council is wearisome. Not that I am quite ready for Richmond yet. We must look after home and plantation affairs, which we have sadly neglected. Heaven help my husband through the deep waters. The wedding of Miss Aiken, daughter of Governor Aiken, the largest slave owner in South Carolina, Julia Rutledge, one of the bridesmaids, the place Flat Rock. We could not for a while imagine what Julia would do for a dress. My sister Kate remembered some muslin she had in the house for curtains, bought before the war, and laid aside as not needed now. The stuff was white and thin, a little coarse, but then we covered it with no end of beautiful lace. It made a charming dress, and how altogether lovely Julia looked in it. The night of the wedding it stormed as if the world were coming to an end. Wind, rain, thunder, and lightning in an unlimited supply around the mountain cottage. The bride had a duchess dressing table, muslin and lace, not one of the shifts of honest war-driven poverty, but a millionaire's attempt at appearing economical and the idea that that style was in better taste as placing the family more on the same plane with their less comfortable compatriots. A candle was left too near this light drapery, and it took fire. Outside was lightning enough to fire the world. Inside, the bridal chamber was ablaze, and there was wind enough to blow the house down the mountainside. The English maid behaved heroically, and with the aid of Mrs. Aikens and Mrs. Matt Singleton's servants, put the fire out without disturbing the marriage ceremony, then being performed below. Everything in the bridal chamber was burned up except the bed, and that was a mass of cinders, soot, and flakes of charred and blackened wood. At Kingsville I caught a glimpse of our army. Longstreet's corps was going west. God bless the gallant fellows. Not one man was intoxicated. Not one rude word did I hear. It was a strange sight, one part of it. There were miles, apparently, of platform cars, soldiers rolled in their blankets, lying in rows, heads all covered, fast asleep. In their gray blankets, packed in regular order, they looked like swathed mummies. One man near where I sat was writing on his knee. He used his cap for a desk, and he was seated on a rail. I watched him, wondering to whom that letter was to go. Home, no doubt. Sore hearts for him there. A feeling of awful depression laid hold of me. All these fine fellows were going to kill or be killed. Why? And a phrase got to beating about my head like an old song, The Unreturning Brave. When a knot of boyish, laughing young creatures passed me, a queer thrill of sympathy shook me. Ah, I know how your home folks feel, poor children. Once last winter persons came to us in Camden with such strange stories of Captain Blank, Morgan's man, stories of his father, too, turf tales and murder, or at least how he killed people. He had been a tremendous favorite with my husband, who brought him in once, leading him by the hand. Afterward he said to me, With these girls in the house we must be more cautious. I agreed to be coldly polite to Blank. After all, I said, I barely know him. When he called afterward in Richmond, I was very glad to see him, utterly forgetting that he was under a ban. We had a long, confidential talk. He told me of his wife and children, of his army career, and told Morgan stories. He grew more and more cordial, and so did I. He thanked me for the kind reception given him in that house told me I was a true friend of his, and related to me a scrape he was in which, if divulged, would ruin him, although he was innocent, but time would clear all things. He begged me not to repeat anything he had told me of his affairs, not even to Colonel Chestnut, which I promised promptly, and then he went away. 
I sat poking the fire, thinking what a curiously interesting creature he was, this famous Captain Blank, when the folding doors slowly opened and Colonel Chestnut appeared. He had come home two hours ago from the war office with a headache, and had been lying on the sofa behind that folding door, listening for mortal hours. "'So this is your style of being coldly polite,' he said. "'Fancy my feelings.' Indeed, I had forgotten all about what they had said of him. The lies they told of him never once crossed my mind. He is a great deal cleverer, and I dare say just as good as those who malign him. Maddie Reedy, I knew her as a handsome girl in Washington several years ago, got tired of hearing Federals abusing John Morgan. One day they were worse than ever in their abuse, and she grew restive. By way of putting a mark against the name of so rude a girl, the Yankee officer said, What is your name? Write Matty Reedy now, but by the grace of God one day I hope to call myself the wife of John Morgan. She did not know Morgan, but Morgan eventually heard the story. A good joke it was said to be. But he made it a point to find her out, and as she was as pretty as she was patriotic, by the grace of God she is now Mrs. Morgan. These timid southern women under the guns can be brave enough. Aunt Charlotte has told a story of my dear mother. They were up at Shelby, Alabama, a white man's country, where Negroes are not wanted. The ladies had with them several Negroes belonging to my uncle, at whose house they were staying in the owner's absence. One Negro man, who had married and dwelt in a cabin, was for some cause particularly obnoxious to the neighborhood. My aunt and my mother old-fashioned ladies, shrinking from everything outside their own door, knew nothing of all this. They occupied rooms on opposite sides of an open passageway. Underneath, the house was open and unfinished. Suddenly, one night, my aunt heard a terrible noise, apparently as of a man running for his life, pursued by men and dogs, shouting, hallooing, barking. She had only time to lock herself in. Utterly cut off from her sister, she sat down, dumb with terror, when there began loud knocking at the door, with men swearing, dogs tearing round, sniffing, racing in and out of the passage, and barking underneath the house like mad. Aunt Charlotte was sure she heard the panting of a negro as he ran into the house a few minutes before. What could have become of him? Where could he have hidden? The men shook the doors and windows, loudly threatening vengeance. My aunt pitied her feeble sister, cut off in the room across the passage. This fright might kill her. The cursing and shouting continued, unabated. A man's voice, in harshest accents, made itself heard above all. "'Leave my house, you rascals,' said the voice. "'If you are not gone in two seconds, I'll shoot.' There was a dead silence, except for the noise of the dogs. Quickly the men slipped away. Once out of gunshot, they began to call their dogs. After it was all over, my aunt crept across the passage. Sister, what man was it scared them away? My mother laughed aloud in her triumph. I am the man, she said. But where is John? Out crept John from a corner of the room where my mother had thrown some rubbish over him. Law bless you, Miss Mary opened the door for me, and they was right behind running me. Aunt says mother was awfully proud of her prowess, and she showed some moral courage, too. At the President's in Richmond once, General Lee was there, and Constance and Hetty Carey came in, also Miss Sanders and others. Constance Carey was telling some more anecdotes, among them one of an attempt to get up a supper the night before at some high and mighty F.F.V.'s house and of how several gentlefolks went into the kitchen to prepare something to eat by the light of one forlorn candle. One of the men in the party, not being of a useful temperament, turned up a tub and sat down upon it. Custis Lee, wishing also to rest, found nothing upon which to sit but a gridiron. Footnote. Miss Constance Carey afterward married Burton Harrison and settled in New York, where she became prominent socially and achieved reputation as a novelist. In footnote. One remembrance I kept of the evening at the President's, General Lee bowing over the beautiful Miss Carey's hands in the passage outside. Miss Blank rose to have her part in the picture, and asked Mr. Davis to walk with her into the adjoining drawing-room. 
He seemed surprised, but rose stiffly, and with a scowling brow was led off. As they passed where Mrs. Davis sat, Miss Blank, with all sail set, looked back and said, "'Don't be jealous, Mrs. Davis. I have an important communication to make to the President.' Mrs. Davis's amusement resulted in a significant, "'Now, did you ever?' During Stoneman's raid on a Sunday, I was in Mrs. Randolph's pew. The Battle of Chancellorsville was also raging. The rattling of ammunition wagons, the tramp of soldiers, the everlasting slamming of those iron gates of the Capitol Square just opposite the church, made it hard to attend to the service. Then began a scene calculated to make the stoutest heart quail. The sexton would walk quietly up the aisle to deliver messages to worshippers whose relatives had been brought in wounded, dying, or dead. Pale-faced people would then follow him out. Finally, the Reverend Mr. Minigerode bent across the chancel rail to the sexton for a few minutes, whispered with the sexton, and then disappeared. The assistant clergyman resumed the communion which Mr. Minigerode had been administering. At the church door stood Mrs. Minigerode as tragically wretched and as wild-looking as ever Mrs. Siddons was. She managed to say to her husband, "'Your son is at the station, dead.' When these agonized parents reached the station, however, it proved to be someone else's son who was dead, but a son all the same. Pale and wan came Mr. Minigerode back to his place within the altar rails. After the sacred communion was over, someone asked him what it all meant, and he said, Oh, it was not my son who was killed, but it came so near it aches me yet. At home I found L. Q. Washington, who stayed to dinner. I saw that he and my husband were intently preoccupied by some event which they did not see fit to communicate to me. Immediately after dinner my husband lent Mr. Washington one of his horses, and they rode off together. I betook myself to my kind neighbors, the Pattons, for information. There I found Colonel Patton had gone, too. Mrs. Patton, however, knew all about the trouble. She said there was a raiding party within forty miles of us, and no troops were in Richmond. They asked me to stay to tea, those kind ladies, and in some way we might learn what was going on. After tea we went out to the Capitol Square, Lawrence and three men-servants going along to protect us. They seemed to be mustering in citizens by the thousands. Company after company was being formed, then battalions, and then regiments. It was a wonderful sight to us, peering through the iron railing, watching them fall into ranks. Then we went to the President's, finding the family at supper. We sat on the white marble steps, and General Elsie told me exactly how things stood and of our immediate danger. Pickets were coming in. Men were spurring to and from the door as fast as they could ride, bringing and carrying messages and orders. Calmly General Elsie discoursed upon our present weakness and our chances for aid. After a while Mrs. Davis came out and embraced me silently. "'It is dreadful,' I said. "'The enemy is within forty miles of us. Only forty. "'Who told you that tale?' said she. "'They are within three miles of Richmond.' I went down on my knees like a stone. "'You had better be quiet,' she said. "'The President is ill. Women and children must not add to the trouble.' She asked me to stay all night, which I was thankful to do. We sat up. Officers were coming and going, and we gave them what refreshment we could from a side table, kept constantly replenished. Finally, in the excitement, the constant state of activity and change of persons, we forgot the danger. Officers told us jolly stories and seemed in fine spirits, so we gradually took heart. There was not a moment's rest for anyone. Mrs. Davis said something more amusing than ever. We look like frightened women and children, don't we? Early next morning the President came down. He was still feeble and pale from illness. Custis Lee and my husband loaded their pistols, and the President drove off in Dr. Garnett's carriage, my husband and Custis Lee on horseback alongside him. By eight o'clock the troops from Petersburg came in, and the danger was over. The authorities will never strip Richmond of troops again. We had a narrow squeeze for it, but we escaped. It was a terrible night, although we made the best of it. I was walking on Franklin Street when I met my husband. 
Come with me to the war office for a few minutes, said he, and then I will go home with you. What could I do but go? He took me up a dark stairway, and then down a long, dark corridor, and he left me sitting in a window, saying he would not be gone a second. He was obliged to go into the Secretary of War's room. There I sat mortal hours. Men came to light the gas. From the first I put down my veil so that nobody might know me. Numbers of persons passed that I knew, but I scarcely felt respectable seated up there in that odd way. So I said not a word, but looked out of the window. Judge Campbell slowly walked up and down with his hands behind his back, the saddest face I ever saw. He had jumped down in his patriotism from judge of the Supreme Court, USA, to be under secretary of something or other, I do not know what, CSA. No wonder he was out of spirits that night. Finally Judge Old came. Him I called and he joined me at once, in no little amazement to find me there, and stayed with me until James Chestnut appeared. In point of fact, I sent him to look up that stray member of my family. When my husband came, he said, Oh, Mr. Seddon and I got into an argument, and time slipped away. The truth is, I utterly forgot you were here. When we were once more out in the street, he began, now don't scold me, for there is bad news. Pemberton has been fighting the Yankees by brigades, and he has been beaten every time, and now Vicksburg must go. I suppose that was his side of the argument with Seddon. Once again I visited the war office. I went with Mrs. Old to see her husband at his office. We wanted to arrange a party on the river on the flag of truce boat, and to visit those beautiful places, Claremont and Brandon. My husband got into one of his too-careful fits, said there was risk in it, and so he upset all our plans. Then I was to go up to John Rutherford's by the canal boat. That, too, he vetoed too risky, as if anybody was going to trouble us. October 24th. James Chestnut is at home on his way back to Richmond, had been sent by the President to make the rounds of the Western armies, says Polk is a splendid old fellow. They accuse him of having been asleep in his tent at seven o'clock when he was ordered to attack at daylight, but he has too good a conscience to sleep so soundly. The battle did not begin until eleven at Chickamauga, when Bragg had ordered the advance at daylight. Footnote. The Battle of Chickamauga was fought on the river of the same name near Chattanooga, September 19 and 20, 1863. The Confederates were commanded by Bragg and the Federals by Rosecrans. It was one of the bloodiest battles of the war. The loss on each side, including killed, wounded, and prisoners, was over 15,000. End footnote. Bragg and his generals do not agree. I think a general worthless whose subalterns quarrel with him. Something is wrong about the man. Good generals are adored by their soldiers. See Napoleon, Caesar, Stonewall, Lee. Old Sam, Hood, received his orders to hold a certain bridge against the enemy, and he had already driven the enemy several miles beyond it, when the slow generals were still asleep. Hood has won a victory, though he has only one leg to stand on. Mr. Chestnut was with the President when he reviewed our army under the enemy's guns before Chattanooga. He told Mr. Davis that every honest man he saw out west thought well of Joe Johnston. He knows that the President detests Joe Johnston for all the trouble he has given him, and General Joe returns the compliment with compound interest. His hatred of Jeff Davis amounts to a religion. With him it colors all things. Joe Johnston advancing, or retreating, I may say with more truth, is magnetic. He does draw the good will of those by whom he is surrounded. Being such a good hater, it is a pity he had not elected to hate somebody else than the President of our country. He hates not wisely, but too well. Our friend Breckinridge received Mr. Chestnut with open arms. Footnote. John C. Breckinridge had been Vice President of the United States under Buchanan, and was the candidate of the Southern Democrats for President in 1860. He joined the Confederate Army in 1861. End footnote. There is nothing narrow, nothing self-seeking, about Breckinridge. He has not mounted a pair of green spectacles made of prejudices, so that he sees no good except in his own red-hot partisans. 
October 27th. Young Wade Hampton has been here for a few days, a guest of our nearest neighbor and cousin, Phil Stockton. Wade, without being the beauty or the athlete that his brother Preston is, is such a nice boy. We lent him horses, and ended by giving him a small party. What was lacking in company was made up for by the excellence of old Colonel Chestnut's ancient Madeira and Champagne. If everything in the Confederacy were only as truly good as the old Colonel's wine cellars. Then we had a salad and a jelly cake. General Joe Johnston is so careful of his aides that Wade has never yet seen a battle. Says he has always happened to be sent afar off when the fighting came. He does not seem too grateful for this, and means to be transferred to his father's command. He says, No man exposes himself more recklessly to danger than General Johnston, and no one strives harder to keep others out of it. But the business of this war is to save the country, and a commander must risk his men's lives to do it. There is a French saying that you can't make an omelet unless you are willing to break eggs. November 5th. For a week we have had such a tranquil, happy time here. Both my husband and Johnny are here still. James Chestnut spent his time sauntering around with his father, or stretched on the rug before my fire reading Vanity Fair and Pendennis. By good luck he had not read them before. We have kept Esmond for the last. He owns that he is having a good time. Johnny is happy, too. He does not care for books. He will read a novel now and then, if the girls continue to talk of it before him. Nothing else whatever in the way of literature does he touch. He comes pulling his long blond mustache irresolutely, as if he hoped to be advised not to read it. Aunt Mary, shall I like this thing? I do not think he has an idea of what we are fighting about and he does not want to know. He says, My company, my men, with a pride, a faith, and an affection which are sublime. He came into his inheritance at twenty-one, just as the war began, and it was a goodly one, fine old houses, and an estate to match. Yesterday Johnny went to his plantation for the first time since the war began. John Witherspoon went with him, and reports in this way. How do you do, master? How do you come on? Thus from every side rang the noisiest welcome from the darkies. Johnny was silently shaking black hands right and left as he rode into the crowd. As the noise subsided, to the overseer he said, Send down more corn and fodder for my horses. And to the driver, Have you any peas? Plenty, sir. Send a wagon load down for the cows at Bloomsbury while I stay there. They have not milk and butter enough there for me. Any eggs? Send down all you can collect. How about my turkeys and ducks? Send them down two at a time. How about the mutton? Fat? That's good. Send down two a week. As they rode home, John Witherspoon remarked, I was surprised that you did not go into the fields to see your crops. What was the use? And the Negroes, you had so little talk with them. No use to talk to them before the overseer. They are coming down to Bloomsbury, day and night, by platoons, and they talk me dead. Besides, William and Parrish go up there every night, and God knows they tell me enough plantation scandal. Overseer feathering his nest, Negroes ditto at my expense. Between the two fires I mean to get something to eat while I am here. For him we got up a charming picnic at Mulberry. Everything was propitious, the most perfect of days, and the old place in great beauty. Those large rooms were delightful for dancing. We had as good a dinner as mortal appetite could crave, the best fish, fowl, and game, wine from a cellar that cannot be excelled. In spite of blockade, Mulberry does the honors nobly yet. Mrs. Edward Stockton drove down with me. She helped me with her taste and tact in arranging things. We had no trouble, however. All of the old servants who have not been moved to Bloomsbury scented the prey from afar, and they literally flocked in and made themselves useful. End of chapter 15sixteen part one of a diary from Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. A diary from Dixie by Mary Chestnut. Chapter 16. Richmond, Virginia. 
November 28, 1863, to April 11, 1864. Part 1. Richmond, Virginia, November 28, 1863. Our pleasant home sojourn was soon broken up. Johnny had to go back to Company A, and my husband was ordered by the President to make a second visit to Bragg's army. Footnote. Braxton Bragg was a native of North Carolina and had won distinction in the war with Mexico. End footnote. So we came on here where the Prestons had taken apartments for me. Molly was with me. Adam Team, the overseer, with Isaac McLaughlin's help, came with us to take charge of the eight huge boxes of provisions I brought from home. Isaac, Molly's husband, is a servant of ours, the only one my husband ever bought in his life. Isaac's wife belonged to Reverend Thomas Davis, and Isaac to somebody else. The owner of Isaac was about to go west, and Isaac was distracted. They asked one thousand dollars for him. He is a huge creature, really a magnificent specimen of a colored gentleman. His occupation had been that of a stage driver. Now he is a carpenter, or will be some day. He is awfully grateful to us for buying him, is really devoted to his wife and children, though he has a strange way of showing it, for he has a mistress, en titre, as the French say, which fact Molly never failed to grumble about as soon as his back was turned. Great big good-for-nothing thing come a-whimpering to master to buy him for his wife's sake, and all the time he and— Oh, Molly, stop that, said I. Mr. Davis visited Charleston and had an enthusiastic reception. He described it all to General Preston. Governor Aiken's perfect old Carolina style of living delighted him. Those old gray-haired darkies in their noiseless automatic service, the result of finished training, one does miss that sort of thing when away from home, where your own servants think for you. They know your ways and your wants. They save you all responsibility, even in matters of your own ease and well-doing. The butler at Mulberry would be miserable and feel himself a ridiculous failure were I ever forced to ask him for anything. November 30th. I must describe an adventure I had in Kingsville. Of course, I know nothing of children. In point of fact, I'm awfully afraid of them. Mrs. Edward Barnwell came with us from Camden. She had a magnificent boy two years old. Now, don't expect me to reduce that adjective, for this little creature is a wonder of childlike beauty, health, and strength. Why not? If like produces like, and with such a handsome pair to claim as father and mother. The boy's eyes alone would make any girl's fortune. At first he made himself very agreeable, repeating nursery rhymes and singing. Then something went wrong. Suddenly he changed to a little fiend, fought and kicked and scratched like a tiger. He did everything that was naughty, and he did it with a will as if he liked it, while his lovely mamma, with flushed cheeks and streaming eyes, was imploring him to be a good boy. When we stopped at Kingsville, I got out first, then Mrs. Barnwell's nurse, who put the little man down by me. "'Look after him a moment, please, ma'am,' she said. "'I must help Mrs. Barnwell with the bundles, etc.' She stepped hastily back, and the cars moved off. They ran down a half-mile to turn. I trembled in my shoes. This child! No man could ever frighten me so. If he should choose to be bad again! It seemed an eternity while I waited for that train to turn and come back again. My little charge took things quietly. For me he had a perfect contempt, no fear whatever and I was his abject slave for the nonce. He stretched himself out lazily at full length. Then he pointed downward. "'Those are great legs,' said he solemnly, looking at his own. I immediately joined him in admiring them enthusiastically. Near him he spied a bundle. "'Pussycat tied up in that bundle.' He was up in a second and pounced upon it. "'If we were to be taken up as thieves,' No matter. I dared not meddle with that child. I had seen what he could do. There were several cooked sweet potatoes tied up in an old handkerchief, belonging to some negro, probably. He squared himself off comfortably, broke one in half, and began to eat. Evidently he had found what he was fond of. In this posture Mrs. Barnwell discovered us. She came with comic dismay in every feature, not knowing what our relations might be, and whether or not we had undertaken to fight it out alone as best we might. The old nurse cried, 
Lousy me, with both hands uplifted. Without a word, I fled. In another moment, the Wilmington train would have left me. She was going to Columbia. We broke down only once between Kingsville and Wilmington. But between Wilmington and Weldon, we contrived to do the thing so effectually as to have to remain twelve hours at that forlorn station. The one room that I saw was crowded with soldiers. Adam Team succeeded in securing two chairs for me, upon one of which I sat, and put my feet on the other. Molly sat flat on the floor, resting her head against my chair. I woke cold and cramped. An officer, who did not give his name, but said he was from Louisiana, came up and urged me to go near the fire. He gave me his seat by the fire, where I found an old lady and two young ones, with two men in the uniform of common soldiers. We talked as easily to each other all night as if we had known one another all our lives. We discussed the war, the army, the news of the day. No questions were asked, no names given, no personal discourse whatever. And yet, if these men and women were not gentry, and of the best sort, I do not know ladies and gentlemen when I see them. Being a little surprised at the want of interest Mr. Team and Isaac showed in my well-doing, I walked out to see, and I found them working like beavers. They had been at it all night. In the breakdown my boxes were smashed. They had first gathered up the contents and were trying to hammer up the boxes so as to make them once more available. At Petersburg, a smartly dressed woman came in, looked around in the crowd, and then asked for the seat by me. Now, Molly's seat was paid for the same as mine, but she got up at once, gave the lady her seat, and stood behind me. I am sure Molly believes herself my bodyguard, as well as my servant. The lady, then having arranged herself comfortably in Molly's seat, began in plaintive accents to tell her melancholy tale. She was a widow. She lost her husband in the battles around Richmond. Soon someone went out, and a man offered her the vacant seat. Straight as an arrow she went in for a flirtation with the polite gentleman. Another person, a perfect stranger, said to me, "'Well, look yonder. As soon as she began whining about her dead beau, I knew she was after another one.' "'Beau, indeed,' cried another listener. She said it was her husband." Husband or lover, all the same, she won't lose any time. It won't be her fault if she doesn't have another one soon. But the grand scene was the night before. The cars crowded with soldiers, of course. Not a human being that I knew. An Irish woman, so announced by her brogue, came in. She marched up and down the car, loudly lamenting the want of gallantry in the men who would not make way for her. Two men got up and gave her their seats, saying it did not matter, they were going to get out at the next stopping place. She was gifted with the most pronounced brogue I ever heard, and she gave us a taste of it. She continued to say that the men ought all to get out of that, that car was shootable only for ladies. She placed on the vacant seat next to her a large looking-glass. She continued to harangue until she fell asleep. A tired soldier coming in, seeing what he supposed to be an empty seat, quietly slipped into it. Crash went the glass. The soldier groaned, the Irish woman shrieked. The man was badly cut by the broken glass. She was simply a mad woman. She shook her fist in his face, said she was a lone woman and he had got into that seat for no good purpose. How did he dare to, etc. I do not think the man uttered a word. The conductor took him into another car to have the pieces of glass picked out of his clothes, and she continued to rave. Mr. Team shouted aloud and laughed as if he were in the hermitage swamp. The woman's unreasonable wrath and absurd accusations were comic, no doubt. Soon the car was silent, and I fell into a comfortable doze. I felt Molly give me a gentle shake. Listen, missus, how loud Mars Adam Team is talkin', and all about old master and our business, and to strangers. It's a shame. Is he saying any harm of us? No, ma'am, not that. He is bragging for dear life about how old old master is, and how rich he is, and all that. I go and tell him stop. Up started Molly. Mars Adam, missus say, please don't talk so loud. When people travel, they don't do that away. Mr. Preston's man, Hal, was waiting at the depot with a carriage to take me to my Richmond house. Mary Preston had rented these apartments for me. 
I found my dear girls there with a nice fire. Everything looked so pleasant and inviting to the weary traveller. Mrs. Grundy, who occupies the lower floor, sent me such a real Virginia tea, hot cakes, and rolls. Think of living in the house with Mrs. Grundy, and having no fear of what Mrs. Grundy will say. My husband has come. He likes the house, Grundy's, and everything. Already he has bought Grundy's horses for sixteen hundred Confederate dollars cash. He is nearer to being contented and happy than I ever saw him. He has not established a grievance yet, but I am on the lookout daily. He will soon find out whatever there is wrong about Cary Street. I gave a party. Mrs. Davis, very witty. Preston girls, very handsome. Isabella's fun, fast and furious. No party could have gone off more successfully, but my husband decides we are to have no more festivities. This is not the time or the place for such gaieties. Maria Freeland is perfectly delightful on the subject of her wedding. She is ready to the last piece of lace, but her hard-hearted father says, No. She adores John Lewis. That goes without saying. She does not pretend, however, to be as much in love as Mary Preston. In point of fact, she never saw anyone before who was. But she is as much in love as she can be with a man who, though he is not very handsome, is as eligible a match as a girl could make. He is all that heart could wish, and he comes of such a handsome family. His mother, Esther Maria Cox, was the beauty of a century, and his father was a nephew of General Washington. For all that, he is far better looking than John Darby or Mr. Miles. She always intended to marry better than Mary Preston or Betty Bierne. Lucy Haxall is positively engaged to Captain Coffey, an Englishman. She is convinced that she will marry him. He is her first fancy. Mr. Venable, of Lee's staff, was at our party, so out of spirits. He knows everything that is going on. His depression bodes us no good. Today General Hampton sent James Chestnut a fine saddle that he had captured from the Yankees in battle array. Mrs. Scotch Allen, Edgar Allan Poe's patron's wife, sent me ice cream and lady cheek apples from her farm. John R. Thompson, the sole literary fellow I know in Richmond, sent me leisure hours in town by a country parson. Footnote. John R. Thompson was a native of Richmond, and in 1847 became editor of the Southern Literary Messenger. Under his direction, that periodical acquired commanding influence. Mr. Thompson's health failed afterward. During the war, he spent a part of his time in Richmond and a part in Europe. He afterward settled in New York and became literary editor of the Evening Post. End footnote. My husband says he hopes I will be contented because he came here this winter to please me. If I could have been satisfied at home, he would have resigned his aide-de-campship and gone into some service in South Carolina. I am a good excuse, if good for nothing else. Old Tempestuous Keat breakfasted with us yesterday. I wish I could remember half the brilliant things he said. My husband has now gone with him to the war office. Colonel Keat thinks it is time he was promoted. He wants to be a brigadier. Now Charleston is bombarded night and day. It fairly makes me dizzy to think of that everlasting racket they are beating about people's ears down there. Bragg defeated and separated from Longstreet. It is a long street that knows no turning, and Rosecrans is not taken after all. November 30th. Anxiety pervades. Lee is fighting Meade. Misery is everywhere. Bragg is falling back before Grant. Footnote. The siege of Chattanooga, which had been begun on September 21st, closed late in November 1863, the final engagements beginning on November 23rd and ending on November 25th. Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge were the closing incidents of the siege. Grant, Sherman, and Hooker were conspicuous on the Federal side, and Bragg and Longstreet on the Confederate. End footnote. Longstreet, the soldiers call him Peter the Slow, is settling down before Knoxville. General Lee requires us to answer every letter, said Mr. Venable, and to do our best to console the poor creatures whose husbands and sons are fighting the battles of the country. December 2nd. Bragg begs to be relieved of his command. 
the army will be relieved to get rid of him. He has a winning way of earning everybody's detestation. Heavens, how they hate him! The rapid flight of his army terminated at Ringgold. Hardy declines even a temporary command of the Western Army. Preston Johnston has been sent out post-haste at a moment's warning. He was not even allowed time to go home and tell his wife good-bye, or, as Brown the Englishman said, to put a clean shirt into his traveling bag. Lee and Meade are facing each other gallantly. Footnote. Following the Battle of Gettysburg on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of this year, there had occurred in Virginia, between Lee and Meade, engagements at Bristow Station, Kelly's Ford, and Rappahannock Station, the latter engagement taking place on November 7th. The author doubtless refers here to the positions of Lee and Meade at Mine Run, December 1st. December 2nd, Meade abandoned his, because, as he is reported to have said, it would have cost him 30,000 men to carry Lee's breastworks, and he shrank from ordering such slaughter. End footnote. The 1st of December we went with a party of Mrs. Old getting up to see a French frigate which lay at anchor down the river. The French officers came on board our boat. The Lees were aboard. The French officers were not in the least attractive, either in manners or appearance. But our ladies were most attentive, and some showered bad French upon them with a lavish hand, always accompanied by queer grimaces to eke out the scanty supply of French words, the sentences ending usually in a nervous shriek. "'Are they deaf?' asked Mrs. Randolph. The French frigate was a dirty little thing. Dr. Garnett was so buoyed up with hope that the French were coming to our rescue that he would not let me say, An English man-of-war is the cleanest thing known in the world. Captain Blank said to Mary Lee, with a foreign contortion of countenance that went for a smile, Eyes, bachelor. Judge Old said, as we went to dinner on our own steamer, They will not drink our President's health. They do not acknowledge us to be a nation. Mind, none of you say emperor, not once. Dr. Garnett interpreted the laws of politeness otherwise, and stepped forward, his mouth fairly distended with so much French, and said, Vif l'empereur. Young Gibson seconded him quietly, A la santé de l'empereur. But silence prevailed. Preston Hampton was the handsomest man on board. The figure of Hercules, the face of Apollo, cried an enthusiastic girl. Preston was as lazy and as sleepy as ever. He said of the Frenchmen, They can't help not being good-looking, but with all the world open to them, to wear such shabby clothes. The lieutenant's name was Rousseau. On the French frigate, lying on one of the tables, was a volume of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's works, side by side, strange to say, with a map of South Carolina. This lieutenant was courteously asked by Mary Lee to select some lady to whom she might introduce him. He answered, I choose you, with a bow that was a benediction and a prayer. And now I am in a fine condition for Hetty Carey's starvation party, where they will give thirty dollars for the music, and not a cent for a morsel to eat. Preston said contentedly, I hate dancing, and I hate cold water so I will eschew the festivity to-night. Found John R. Thompson at our house when I got home so tired to-night. He brought me the last number of the Cornhill. He knew how much I was interested in Trollope's story, Framley Parsonage. December 4th. My husband bought yesterday at the commissary's one barrel of flour, one bushel of potatoes, one peck of rice, five pounds of salt beef, and one peck of salt, all for sixty dollars. In the street, a barrel of flour sells for one hundred and fifteen dollars. December 5th. Wigfall was here last night. He began by wanting to hang Jeff Davis. My husband managed him beautifully. He soon ceased to talk virulent nonsense and calmed down to his usual strong common sense. I knew it was quite late, but I had no idea of the hour. My husband beckoned me out. It is all your fault, said he. What? Why will you persist in looking so interested in all Wigfall is saying? Don't let him catch your eye. Look into the fire. Did you not hear it strike, too? This attack was so sudden, so violent, so unlooked for, I could only laugh hysterically. 
However, as an obedient wife, I went back, gravely took my seat, and looked into the fire. I did not even dare raise my eyes to see what my husband was doing, if he, too, looked into the fire. Wigfall soon tired of so tame an audience, and took his departure. General Lawton was here. He was one of Stonewall's generals, so I listened with all my ears when he said, Stonewall could not sleep, so every two or three nights you are waked up by orders to have your brigade in marching order before daylight, and report in person to the commander. Then you were marched a few miles out, and then a few miles in again. All this was to make us ready, ever on the alert. And the end of it was this. Jackson's men would go half a day's march before Peter Longstreet waked and breakfasted. I think there is a popular delusion about the amount of praying he did. He certainly preferred a fight on Sunday to a sermon. Failing to manage a fight, he loved best a long Presbyterian sermon, Calvinistic to the core. He had shown small sympathy with human infirmity. He was a one-idead man. He looked upon broken-down men and stragglers as the same thing. He classed all who were weak and weary, who fainted by the wayside, as men wanting in patriotism. If a man's face was as white as cotton, and his pulse so low you scarce could feel it, he looked upon him merely as an inefficient soldier, and rode off impatiently. He was the true type of all great soldiers. Like the successful warriors of the world, he did not value human life where he had an object to accomplish. He could order men to their death as a matter of course. His soldiers obeyed him to the death. Faith they had in him stronger than death. Their respect he commanded. I doubt if he had so much of their love as is talked about while he was alive. Now that they see a few more years of Stonewall would have freed them from the Yankees, they deify him. Any man is proud to have been one of the famous Stonewall Brigade. But be sure it was bitter hard work to keep up with him, as all know who ever served under him. He gave his orders rapidly and distinctly, and rode away, never allowing answer or remonstrance. It was, look there, see that place, take it. When you failed, you were apt to be put under arrest. When you reported the place taken, he only said, good. Spent $75 today for a little tea and sugar, and have 500 left. My husband's pay never has paid for the rent of our lodgings. He came in with dreadful news just now. I have wept so often for things that never happen, I will withhold my tears now for a certainty. Today a poor woman threw herself on her dead husband's coffin and kissed it. She was weeping bitterly. So did I in sympathy. My husband, as I told him today, could see me and everything that he loved, hanged, drawn, and quartered, without moving a muscle, if a crowd were looking on. He could have the same gentle operation performed on himself, and make no sign. To all of which violent insinuation he answered in unmoved tones. So would any civilized man. Savages, however, Indians at least, are more dignified in that particular than we are. Noisy, fidgety grief never moves me at all. It annoys me. Self-control is what we all need. You are a miracle of sensibility. Self-control is what you need. So, you are civilized, I said. Some day I mean to be. December 9th. Come here, Mrs. Chestnut, said Mary Preston today. They are lifting General Hood out of his carriage, here at your door. Mrs. Grundy promptly had him borne into her drawing-room, which was on the first floor. Mary Preston and I ran down and greeted him, as cheerfully and as cordially as if nothing had happened since we saw him standing before us a year ago. How he was waited upon! Some cut-up oranges were brought him. "'How kind people are,' said he. "'Not once since I was wounded have I ever been left without fruit, hard as it is to get now.' The money value of friendship is easily counted now, said someone. Oranges are five dollars apiece. December 10th. Mrs. Davis and Mrs. Lyons came. We had luncheon brought in for them, and then a lucid explanation of the chronique scandaleuse of which Beck J. is the heroine. We walked home with Mrs. Davis and met the President riding alone. Surely that is wrong. It must be unsafe for him when there are so many traitors, not to speak of bribed negroes. 
Burton Harrison says Mr. Davis prefers to go alone, and there is none to gainsay him. Footnote. Burton Harrison, then secretary to Jefferson Davis, who married Miss Constance Carey and became well known as a New York lawyer. He died in Washington in 1904. End footnote. My husband laid the law down last night. I felt it to be the last drop in my full cup. No more feasting in this house, said he. This is no time for junketing and merrymaking. And you said you brought me here to enjoy the winter before you took me home and turned my face to a dead wall. He is the master of the house. To hear is to obey. End of chapter 16, part 1. Part two of a diary from Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. A diary from Dixie by Mary Chestnut. Chapter sixteen. Richmond, Virginia. Part two. December fourteenth. Drove out with Mrs. Davis. She had a watch in her hand which some poor dead soldier wanted to have sent to his family. First we went to her mantua maker. Then we drove to the fair grounds where the band was playing. Suddenly she missed the watch. She remembered having it when we came out of the Mantua Makers. We drove back instantly, and there the watch was, lying near the steps of the little porch in front of the house. No one had passed in, apparently. In any case, no one had seen it. Preston Hampton went with me to see Connie Carey. The talk was frantically literary, which Preston thought hard on him. I had just brought the Saint Denis number of Les Miserables. Sunday, Christopher Hampton walked to church with me. Coming out, General Lee was seen slowly making his way down the aisle, bowing royally to right and left. I pointed him out to Christopher Hampton when General Lee happened to look our way. He bowed low, giving me a charming smile of recognition. I was ashamed of being so pleased. I blushed like a schoolgirl. We went to the White House. They gave us tea. The President said he had been on the way to our house, coming with all the Davis family, to see me but the children became so troublesome they turned back. Just then little Joe rushed in and insisted on saying his prayers at his father's knee, then and there. He was in his night clothes. December 19th. A box has come from home for me. Taking advantage of this good fortune and a full larder, have asked Mrs. Davis to dine with me. Wade Hampton sent me a basket of game. We had Mrs. Davis and Mr. and Mrs. Preston. After dinner we walked to the church to see the Freeland Lewis wedding. Mr. Preston had Mrs. Davis on his arm. My husband and Mrs. Preston and Burton Harrison and myself brought up the rear. Willie Allen joined us, and we had the pleasure of waiting one good hour. Then the beautiful Maria, loveliest of brides, sailed in on her father's arm, and Major John Cox Lewis followed with Mrs. Freeland. After the ceremony such a kissing was there up and down the aisle. The happy bridegroom kissed wildly, and several girls complained. But he said, How am I to know Maria's kin whom I was to kiss? It is better to show too much affection for one's new relations than too little. December 21st. Joe Johnston has been made Commander-in-Chief of the Army of the West. General Lee had this done, tis said. Miss Agnes Lee and Little Robert, as they fondly call General Lee's youngest son in this hero-worshipping community, called. They told us the President, General Lee, and General Elsey had gone out to look at the fortifications around Richmond. My husband came home saying he had been with them, and lent General Lee his gray horse. Mrs. Howell, Mrs. Davis's mother, says a year ago on the cars a man said, We want a dictator. She replied, Jeff Davis will never consent to be a dictator. The man turned sharply toward her. And, pray, who asks him? Joe Johnston will be made dictator by the Army of the West. Imperator was suggested. Of late the Army of the West has not been in a condition to dictate to friend or foe. Certainly Jeff Davis did hate to put Joe Johnston at the head of what is left of it. Detached from General Lee, what a horrible failure is Longstreet. Oh, for a day of Albert Sidney Johnston out West. And Stonewall... Could he come back to us here? General Hood, the wounded knight, came for me to drive. 
I felt that I would soon find myself chaperoning some girls, but I asked no questions. He improved the time between Franklin and Cary Streets by saying, I do like your husband so much. So do I, I replied simply. Buck was ill in bed, so William said at the door, but she recovered her health and came down for the drive in black velvet and ermine, looking queenly. And then, with the top of the landau thrown back, wrapped in furs and rugs, we had a long drive that bitter cold day. One day, as we were hieing us home from the fairgrounds, Sam, the wounded knight, asked Brewster what are the symptoms of a man's being in love. Sam, Hood is called Sam entirely, but why I do not know, said for his part he did not know. At seventeen he had fancied himself in love, but that was a long time ago. Brewster spoke on the symptoms of love. When you see her, your breath is apt to come short. If it amounts to mild strangulation, you have got it bad. You are stupidly jealous, glowering with jealousy, and have a gloomy, fixed conviction that she likes every fool you meet better than she does you, especially people that you know she has a thorough contempt for. That is, you knew it before you lost your head. I mean, before you fell in love. The last stages of unmitigated spooniness I will spare you, said Brewster, with a giggle and a wave of the hand. Well, said Sam, drawing a breath of relief, I have felt none of these things so far, and yet they say I am engaged to four young ladies, a liberal allowance, you will admit, for a man who cannot walk without help. Another day, the Sabbath, we called on our way from church to see Mrs. Wigfall. She was ill, but Mr. Wigfall insisted upon taking me into the drawing-room to rest a while. He said Luly was there. So she was, and so was Sam Hood, the wounded knight, stretched at full length on a sofa and a rug thrown over him. Louis Wigfall said to me, Do you know General Hood? Yes, said I, and the general laughed with his eyes as I looked at him, but he did not say a word. I felt it a curious commentary upon the reports he had spoken of the day before. Luly Wigfall is a very handsome girl. December 24th. As we walked, Brewster reported a row he had had with General Hood. Brewster had told those six young ladies at the Prestons that old Sam was in the habit of saying he would not marry, if he could, any silly, sentimental girl who would throw herself away upon a maimed creature such as he was. When Brewster went home, he took pleasure in telling Sam how the ladies had complimented his good sense, whereupon the general rose in his wrath and threatened to break his crutch over Brewster's head. To think he could be such a fool, to go about repeating to everybody his whimperings. I was taking my seat at the head of the table when the door opened and Brewster walked in unannounced. He took his stand in front of the open door, with his hands in his pockets, and his small hat pushed back as far as it could get from his forehead. What, said he, you are not ready yet? The generals are below. Did you get my note? I begged my husband to excuse me, and rushed off to put on my bonnet and furs. I met the girls coming up with a strange man. The flurry of two major generals had been too much for me, and I forgot to ask the new one's name. They went up to dine in my place with my husband, who sat eating his dinner, with Lawrence's undivided attention given to him, amid this whirling and eddying in and out of the world militant. Mary Preston and I then went to drive with the generals. The new one proved to be Buckner, who was also a Kentuckian. Footnote. Simon B. Buckner was a graduate of West Point, and had served in the Mexican War. In 1887 he was elected governor of Kentucky, and at the funeral of General Grant acted as one of the pallbearers. End footnote. The two men told us they had slept together the night before Chickamauga. It is useless to try. Legs can't any longer be kept out of conversation. So General Buckner said, Once before I slept with a man, and he lost his leg next day. He had made a vow never to do so again. When Sam and I parted that morning, we said, You or I may be killed, but the cause will be safe all the same. After the drive, everybody came in to tea, my husband in famous good humor. We had an unusually gay evening. It was very nice of my husband to take no notice of my conduct at dinner, which had been open to criticism. All the comfort of my life depends upon his being in good humor. 
Christmas Day, 1863. Yesterday dined with the Prestons. Wore one of my handsomest Paris dresses, from Paris before the war. Three magnificent Kentucky generals were present, with Senator Orr from South Carolina and Mr. Miles. General Buckner repeated a speech of Hood's to show him how friendly they were. "'I prefer a ride with you to the company of any woman in the world,' Buckner had answered. "'I prefer your company to that of any man, certainly,' was Hood's reply. This became the standing joke of the dinner. It flashed up in every form. Poor Sam got out of it so badly if he got out of it at all. General Buckner said patronizingly, "'Lame excuses all. Hood never gets out of any scrape, that is, unless he can fight out.' Others dropped in after dinner, some without arms, some without legs. Von Borka, who cannot speak because of a wound in his throat. Isabella said, We have all kinds now but a blind one. Poor fellows, they laugh at wounds, and they yet can show many a scar. We had for dinner oyster soup, besides roast mutton, ham, bone turkey, wild duck, partridge, plum pudding, sauterne, burgundy, sherry, and madeira. There is life in the old land yet. At my house today after dinner, and while Alex Haskell and my husband sat over the wine, Hood gave me an account of his discomfiture last night. He said he could not sleep after it. It was the hardest battle he had ever fought in his life. And I was routed, as it were. She told me there was no hope. That ends it. You know, at Petersburg, on my way to the Western Army, she half promised me to think of it. She would not say yes, but she did not say no. That is, not exactly. At any rate, I went off saying, I am engaged to you. And she said, I am not engaged to you. After I was so fearfully wounded, I gave it up. But then, since I came, etc. Do you mean to say, said I, that you had proposed to her before that conversation in the carriage, when you asked Brewster the symptoms of love? I like your audacity. Oh, she understood, but it is all up now, for she says no. My husband says I am extravagant. No, my friend, not that, said I. I had fifteen hundred dollars, and I have spent every cent of it in my housekeeping. Not one cent for myself, not one cent for dress, nor any personal want whatever. He calls me hospitality run mad. January 1, 1864. General Hood's an awful flatterer. I mean, an awkward flatterer. I told him to praise my husband to someone else, not to me. He ought to praise me to somebody who would tell my husband, and then praise my husband to another person who would tell me. Man and wife are too much one person. To wave a compliment straight in the face of one about the other is not graceful. One more year of Stonewall would have saved us. Chickamauga is the only battle we have gained since Stonewall died, and no results follow as usual. Stonewall was not so much as killed by a Yankee. He was shot by his own men. That is hard. General Lee can do no more than keep back Meade. One of Meade's armies, you mean, said I, for they have only to double on him when Lee whips one of them. General Edward Johnston says he got Grant a place, esprit de corps, you know. He could not bear to see an old army man driving a wagon. That was when he found him out west, put out of the army for habitual drunkenness. He is their right man, a bull-headed suaro. He don't care a snap if men fall like the leaves fall. He fights to win, that chap does. He is not distracted by a thousand side issues. He does not see them. He is narrow and sure, sees only in a straight line. Like Louis Napoleon, from a battle in the gutter he goes straight up. Yes, as with Lincoln, they have ceased to carp at him as a rough clown, no gentleman, etc. You never hear now of Lincoln's nasty fun, only of his wisdom. Doesn't take much soap and water to wash the hands that the rod of empire sway. They talked of Lincoln's drunkenness, too. Now, since Vicksburg, they have not a word to say against Grant's habits. He has the disagreeable habit of not retreating before irresistible veterans. General Lee and Albert Sidney Johnston show blood and breeding. They are of the Bayard and Philip Sidney order of soldiers. 
Listen, if General Lee had had Grant's resources, he would have bagged the last Yankee, or have had them all safe back in Massachusetts. You mean, if he had not the weight of the Negro question upon him? No, I mean if he had had Grant's unlimited allowance of the powers of war, men, money, ammunition, arms. Mrs. Old says Mrs. Lincoln found the gardener of the White House so nice she would make him a major general. Lincoln remarked to the secretary, Well, the little woman must have her way sometimes. A word of the last night of the old year. Gloria Mundy sent me a cup of strong good coffee. I drank two cups, and so I did not sleep a wink. Like a fool I passed my whole life in review, and bitter memories maddened me quite. Then came a happy thought. I mapped out a story of the war. The plot came to hand, for it was true. Johnny is the hero, a light dragoon and heavy swell. I will call it F.F.'s, for it is the F.F.'s both of South Carolina and Virginia. It is to be a war story, and the filling out of the skeleton was the best way to put myself to sleep. January 4th. Mrs. Ives wants us to translate a French play. A genuine French captain came in from his ship on the James River and gave us good advice as to how to make the selection. General Hampton sent another basket of partridges, and all goes merry as a marriage bell. My husband came in and nearly killed us. He brought this piece of news. North Carolina wants to offer terms of peace. We needed only a break of that kind to finish us. I really shivered nervously as one does when the first handful of earth comes rattling down on the coffin in the grave of one we cared for more than all who are left. January 5th. At Mrs. Preston's met the Light Brigade in battle array, ready to sally forth, conquering and to conquer. They would stand no nonsense from me about staying at home to translate a French play. Indeed, the plays that have been sent us are so indecent, I scarcely know where a play is to be found that would do it all. While at dinner, the President's carriage drove up with only General Hood. He sent up to ask, in Maggie Howell's name, would I go with them. I tied up two partridges between plates with a serviette, for Buck, who is ill, and then went down. We picked up Mary Preston. It was Maggie's drive. As the soldiers say, I was only on escort duty. At the Preston's, Major Venable met us at the door and took in the partridges to Buck. As we drove off, Maggie said, Major Venable is a Carolinian, I see. No, Virginian to the core. But then he was a professor in the South Carolina College before the war. Mary Preston said, She is taking a fling at your weakness for all South Carolina. Came home and found my husband in a bitter mood. It has all gone wrong with our world. The loss of our private fortune, the smallest part. He intimates, with so much human misery filling the air, we might stay at home and think. And go mad? said I. Catch me at it. A yawning grave with piles of red earth thrown on one side. That is the only future I ever see. You remember Emma Stockton? She and I were as blithe as birds that day at Mulberry. I came here the next day, and when I arrived, a telegram said, Emma Stockton found dead in her bed. It is awfully near, that thought. No, no, I will not stop and think of death always. January 8th. Snow of the deepest. Nobody can come today, I thought. But they did. My girls first. Then Constance Carey tripped in, the clever Connie. Hetty is the beauty, so-called, though she is clever enough, too. But Constance is actually clever and has a classically perfect outline. Next came the four Kentuckians and Preston Hampton. He is as tall as the Kentuckians, and ever so much better looking. Then we had eggnog. I was to take Miss Carey to the Simses. My husband inquired the price of a carriage. It was twenty-five dollars an hour. He cursed by all his gods at such extravagance. The play was not worth the candle, or carriage in this instance. In Confederate money it sounds so much worse than it is. I did not dream of asking him to go with me after that lively overture. I did intend to go with you, he said, but you do not ask me. And I have been asking you for twenty years to go with me in vain. Think of that, I said, tragically. We could not wait for him to dress, so I sent the twenty-five dollar an hour carriage back for him. We were behind time as it was. 
When he came, the beautiful Hetty Carey and her friend, Captain Tucker, were with him. Major von Borka and Preston Hampton were at the Careys, in the drawing-room when we called for Constance, who was dressing. I challenged the world to produce finer specimens of humanity than these three, the Prussian, von Borka, Preston Hampton, and Hetty Carey. We spoke to the Prussian about the vote of thanks passed by Congress yesterday, thanks of the country to Major von Borka. The poor man was as modest as a girl, in spite of his huge proportions. "'That is a compliment indeed,' said Hetty. "'Yes, I saw it, and the happiest, the proudest day of my life, as I read it. It was at the hotel breakfast table. I try to hide my face with the newspaper. I feel it grow so red. But my friend, he has his newspaper too, and he sees the same thing. So he looks my way, he says, pointing to me, why does he grow so red? He has got something there. And he laughs. Then I try to read aloud the so kind compliments of the Congress. But he, you, I cannot. He puts his hand to his throat. His broken English and the difficulty of his enunciation with that wound in his windpipe makes it all very touching and very hard to understand. The Sims charade party was a perfect success. The play was charming. Sweet little Mrs. Lawson Clay had a seat for me banked up among women. The female part of the congregation, strictly segregated from the male, were placed all together in rows. They formed a gay parterre, edged by the men in their black coats and gray uniforms. Toward the back part of the room, the mass of black and gray was solid. Captain Tucker bewailed his fate. He was stranded out there with those forlorn men, but could see us laughing, and fancied what we were saying was worth a thousand charades. He preferred talking to a clever woman to any known way of passing a pleasant hour. "'So do I,' somebody said. On a sofa of state in front of all sat the President and Mrs. Davis. Little Maggie Davis was one of the child actresses. Her parents had a right to be proud of her. With her flashing black eyes, she was a marked figure on the stage." She is a handsome creature, and she acted her part admirably. The shrine was beautiful beyond words. The Sims and Ives families are Roman Catholic, and understand getting up that sort of thing. First came the Palmer's Gray, then Mrs. Ives, a solitary figure, the loveliest of penitent women. The Eastern pilgrims were delightfully costumed. We could not understand how so much Christian piety could come clothed in such odalisque robes. Mrs. Old, as a queen, was as handsome and regal as heart could wish for. She was accompanied by a very satisfactory king, whose name, if I ever knew, I have forgotten. There was a resplendent knight of St. John, and then an American Indian. After their orisons, they all knelt and laid something on the altar as a votive gift. Burton Harrison, the President's handsome young secretary, was gotten up as a big brave in a dress presented to Mr. Davis by Indians for some kindness he showed them years ago. It was a complete warrior's outfit, scant as that is. The feathers stuck in the back of Mr. Harrison's head had a charmingly comic effect. He had to shave himself as clean as a baby, or he could not act the beardless chief, spotted tail, billy bowlegs, big thunder, or whatever his character was. So he folded up his loved and lost mustache, the Christianized Red Indian, and laid it on the altar, the most sacred treasure of his life, the witness of his most heroic sacrifice, on the shrine. Senator Hill of Georgia took me in to supper, where were ices, chicken salad, oysters, and champagne. The President came in alone, I suppose, for while we were talking after supper, and your humble servant was standing between Mrs. Randolph and Mrs. Stannard, he approached offered me his arm, and we walked off, oblivious of Mr. Senator Hill. Remember this, ladies, and forgive me for recording it, but Mrs. Stannard and Mrs. Randolph are the handsomest women in Richmond. I am no older than they are, or younger either, sad to say. Now the President walked with me slowly up and down that long room, and our conversation was of the saddest. Nobody knows so well as he the difficulties which beset this hard-driven Confederacy. He has a voice which is perfectly modulated, a comfort in this loud and rough soldier world. I think there is a melancholy cadence in his voice at times, of which he is unconscious when he talks of things as they are now. 
My husband was so intensely charmed with Hetty Carey that he declined at the first call to accompany his wife home in the twenty-five-dollar-an-hour carriage. He ordered it to return. When it came, his wife, a good manager, packed the Careys and him in with herself, leaving the other two men who came with the party, when it was divided into trips, to make their way home in the cold. At our door, near daylight of that bitter cold morning, I had the pleasure to see my husband, like a man, stand and pay for that carriage. Today he is pleased with himself, with me, and with all the world, says if there was no such word as fascinating, you would have to invent one to describe Hetty Carey. End of chapter 16, part 2three of a diary from Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. A diary from Dixie by Mary Chestnut. Chapter sixteen, Richmond, Virginia, Part three. January ninth. Met Mrs. Wigfall. She wants me to take Halsey to Mrs. Randolph's theatricals. I am to get him up as Sir Walter Raleigh. Now General Breckinridge has come. I like him better than any of them. Morgan also is here. Footnote. John H. Morgan, a native of Alabama, entered the Confederate Army in 1861 as a captain, and in 1862 was made a major general. He was captured by the Federals in 1863 and confined in an Ohio penitentiary, but he escaped and once more joined the Confederate Army. In September 1864 he was killed in battle near Greenville, Tennessee. End footnote. These huge Kentuckians fill the town. Isabella says, they hold Morgan accountable for the loss of Chattanooga. The follies of the wise, the weaknesses of the great. She shakes her head significantly when I begin to tell why I like him so well. Last night General Buckner came for her to go with him and rehearse at the Carries for Mrs. Randolph's charades. The President's man, Jim, that he believed in, as we all believe in our own servants, our own people, as we call them, and Betsy, Mrs. Davis's maid, decamped last night. It is miraculous that they had the fortitude to resist the temptation so long. At Mrs. Davis's the hired servants all have been birds of passage. First they were seen with gold galore, and then they would fly to the Yankees, and I am sure they had nothing to tell. It is Yankee money wasted. I do not think it had ever crossed Mrs. Davis's brain that these two could leave her, she knew, however, that Betsy had eighty dollars in gold and two thousand four hundred dollars in Confederate notes. Everybody who comes in brings a little bad news. Not much in itself, but by cumulative process the effect is depressing indeed. January 12th. Tonight there will be a great gathering of Kentuckians. Morgan gives them a dinner. The city of Richmond entertained John Morgan. He is at free quarters. The girls dined here. Connie Carey came back for more white feathers. Isabella had appropriated two sets, and obstinately refused Constance Carey a single feather from her pile. She said, sternly, I have never been on the stage before, and I have a presentiment when my father hears of this I will never go again. I am to appear before the footlights as an English dowager duchess, and I mean to rustle in every feather, to wear all the lace and diamonds these two houses can compass. Mine and Mrs. Preston's. She was jolly but firm, and Constance departed without any additional plumage for her Lady Teasel. January 14th. Gave Mrs. White twenty-three dollars for a turkey. Came home wondering all the way why she did not ask twenty-five. Two more dollars could not have made me balk at the bargain, and twenty-three sounds odd. January 15th. What a day the Kentuckians have had! Mrs. Webb gave them a breakfast. From there they proceeded en masse to General Lawton's dinner, and then came straight here, all of which seems equal to one of Stonewall's forced marches. General Lawton took me in to supper. In spite of his dinner he had misgivings. My heart is heavy, said he, even here. All seems too light, too careless, for such terrible times. It seems out of place here in battle-scarred Richmond. I have heard something of that kind at home. I replied. Hope and fear are both gone, and it is distraction or death with us. I do not see how sadness and despondency would help us. 
If it would do any good, we would be sad enough. We laughed at General Hood. General Lawton thought him better fitted for gallantry on the battlefield than playing a lute in my lady's chamber. When Miss Giles was electrifying the audience as the fair penitent, someone said, "'Oh, that is so pretty!' Hood cried out with stern reproachfulness, "'That is not pretty. It is elegant.' Not only had my house been rifled for theatrical properties, but as the play went on, they came for my black velvet cloak. When it was over, I thought I should never get away, my cloak was so hard to find. But it gave me an opportunity to witness many things behind the scenes, that cloak hunt did. Behind the scenes! I know a little what that means now. General Jeb Stuart was at Mrs. Randolph's in his cavalry jacket and high boots. He was devoted to Hetty Carey. Constance Carey said to me, pointing to his stars, Hetty likes them that way, you know, gilt-edged and with stars. January 16th. A visit from the President's handsome and accomplished secretary, Burton Harrison. I lent him country clergyman in town and elective affinities. He is to bring me Mrs. Norton's Lost and Saved. At Mrs. Randolph's, my husband complimented one of the ladies, who had amply earned his praise by her splendid acting. She pointed to a young man, saying, "'You see that wretch? He has not said one word to me.' My husband asked innocently, "'Why should he? And why is he a wretch?' "'Oh, you know.' Going home, I explained this riddle to him. He is always a year behindhand in gossip." They said those two were engaged last winter, and now there seems to be a screw loose, but that sort of thing always comes right. The Careys prefer James Chestnut to his wife. I don't mind. Indeed, I like it. I do, too. Every Sunday, Mr. Minigerode cried aloud in anguish his litany, from pestilence and famine, battle, murder, and sudden death, and we wailed on our knees, Good Lord, deliver us! And on Monday, and all the week long, we go on as before, hearing of nothing but battle, murder, and sudden death, which are daily events. Now I have a new book. That is the unlooked-for thing, a pleasing incident in this life of monotonous misery. We live in a huge barrack. We are shut in, guarded from light without. At breakfast today came a card, and without an instant's interlude, perhaps the neatest, most fastidious man in South Carolina walked in. I was uncombed, unkempt, tattered, and torn, in my most comfortable, worst-worn, wadded green silk dressing-gown, with a white woolen shawl over my head to keep off drafts. He has not been in the war yet, and now he wants to be captain of an engineer corps. I wish he may get it. He has always been my friend, so he shall lack no aid that I can give. If he can stand the shock of my appearance today, we may reasonably expect to continue friends until death. Of all men, the fastidious Barney Haywood to come in. He faced the situation gallantly. January 18th. Invited to Dr. Hacksaw's last night to meet the Lawtons. Mr. Benjamin dropped in. Footnote. Judah P. Benjamin was born, of Jewish parentage, at St. Croix in the West Indies, and was elected in 1852 to represent Louisiana in the United States Senate, where he served until 1861. In the Confederate administration, he served successively from 1861 to 1865 as Attorney General, Secretary of War, and Secretary of State. At the close of the war, he went to England, where he achieved remarkable success at the bar. End footnote. He is a friend of the house. Mrs. Haxall is a Richmond leader of society, a C. devant beauty and belle, a charming person still, and her hospitality is of the genuine Virginia type. Everything Mr. Benjamin said we listened to, bore in mind, and gave heed to it diligently. He is a Delphic oracle of the innermost shrine, and is supposed to enjoy the honor of Mr. Davis's unreserved confidence. Lamar was asked to dinner here yesterday, so he came today. We had our wild turkey cooked for him yesterday, and I dressed myself within an inch of my life with the best of my four-year-old finery. Two of us, my husband and I, did not damage the wild turkey seriously. So Lamar enjoyed the réchauffé, and commended the art with which Molly had hid the slight loss we had inflicted upon its mighty breast. 
She had piled fried oysters over the turkey so skillfully that unless we had told about it, no one would ever have known that the huge bird was making his second appearance on the board. Lamar was more absent-minded and distrait than ever. My husband behaved like a trump, a well-bred man with all his wits about him, so things went off smoothly enough. Lamar had just read Romola. Across the water he said it was the rage. I am sure it is not as good as Adam Bede or Silas Marner. It is not worthy of the woman who was to rival all but Shakespeare's name below. "'What is the matter with Romola?' he asked. Tito is so mean, and he is mean in such a very mean way, and the end is so repulsive. Petting the husband's illegitimate children and left-handed wives may be magnanimity, but human nature revolts at it. Woman's nature, you mean. Yes, and now another test. Two weeks ago I read this thing with intense interest, and already her Savonarola has faded from my mind. I have forgotten her way of showing Savonarola as completely as I always do forget Bulwer's Rienzi. Oh, I understand you now. It is like Milton's devil. He has obliterated all other devils. You can't fix your mind upon any other. The devil always must be of Miltonic proportions, or you do not believe in him. Goethe's Mephistopheles disputes the crown of the causeway with Lucifer. But soon you begin to feel that Mephistopheles to be a lesser devil, an emissary of the devil only. Is there any Cardinal Wolsey but Shakespeare's? Any Mirabeau but Carlyle's Mirabeau? But the list is too long of those who have been stamped into your brain by genius. The saintly preacher, the woman who stands by Hetty and saves her soul, those heavenly-minded sermons preached by the author of Adam Bede, bear them well in mind while I tell you how this writer, who so well imagines and depicts female purity and piety, was a governess, or something of that sort, and perhaps wrote for a living. At any rate, she had an elective affinity, which was responded to by George Lewis, and so she lives with Lewis. I do not know that she caused the separation between Lewis and his legal wife. They are living in a villa on some Swiss lake, and Mrs. Lewis, of the hour, is a charitable, estimable, agreeable, sympathetic woman of genius. Lamar seemed without prejudices on the subject. At least, he expressed neither surprise nor disapprobation. He said something of genius being above law, but I was not very clear as to what he said on that point. As for me, I said nothing for fear of saying too much. "'You know that Lewis is a writer,' said he. Some people say the man she lives with is a noble man. They say she is kind and good, if a fallen woman. Here the conversation ended. January 20th. And now comes a grand announcement made by the Yankee Congress. They vote one million of men to be sent down here to free the prisoners whom they will not take in exchange. I actually thought they left all these Yankees here on our hands as part of their plan to starve us out. All congressmen under fifty years of age are to leave politics and report for military duty or be conscripted. What enthusiasm there is in their councils! Confusion, rather, it seems to me. Mrs. Old says, The men who frequent her house are more despondent now than ever since this thing began. Our Congress is so demoralized, so confused, so depressed. They have asked the President, whom they have so hated, so insulted, so crossed and opposed and thwarted in every way, to speak to them and advise them what to do. January 21st. Both of us were too ill to attend Mrs. Davis's reception. It proved a very sensational one. First a fire in the house, then a robbery, said to be an arranged plan of the usual bribed servants there and some escaped Yankee prisoners. Today the examiner is lost in wonder at the stupidity of the fire and arson contingent. If they had only waited a few hours until everybody was asleep. After a reception, the household would be so tired and so sound asleep. Thanks to the editor's kind counsel, maybe the arson contingent will wait and do better next time. Letters from home carried Mr. Chestnut off today. Thackeray is dead. I stumbled upon Vanity Fair for myself. I had never heard of Thackeray before. I think it was in 1850. I know I had been ill at the New York Hotel, and when left alone I slipped downstairs and into a bookstore that I had noticed under the hotel for something to read. Footnote. 
The New York Hotel, covering a block front on Broadway at Waverly Place, was a favorite stopping place for Southerners for many years before the war and after it. In comparatively recent times, it was torn down and supplanted by a business block. End footnote. They gave me the first half of Pendennis. I can recall now the very kind of paper it was printed on, and the illustrations, as they took effect upon me. And yet, when I raved over it, and was wild for the other half, there were people who said it was slow, that Thackeray was evidently a coarse, dull, sneering writer, that he stripped human nature bare, and made it repulsive, etc. January 22nd. At Mrs. Lyons met another beautiful woman, Mrs. Penn, the wife of Colonel Penn, who was making shoes in a Yankee prison. She had a little son with her, barely two years old, a mere infant. She said to him, Fate come butler. The child crossed his eyes and made himself hideous, then laughed and rioted around as if he enjoyed the joke hugely. Went to Mrs. Davis's. It was sad enough. Fancy having to be always ready to have your servants set your house on fire, being bribed to do it. Such constant robberies, such servants coming and going daily to the Yankees, carrying one's silver, one's other possessions, does not conduce to home happiness. Saw Hood on his legs once more. He rode off on a fine horse, and managed it well, though he is disabled in one hand, too. After all, as the woman said, he has body enough left to hold his soul. How plucky of him to ride a gay horse like that! Oh, a Kentuckian prides himself upon being half horse and half man. And the girl who rode beside him, did you ever see a more brilliant beauty? Three cheers for South Carolina! I imparted a plan of mine to Brewster. I would have a breakfast, a luncheon, a matinee, call it what you please, but I would try and return some of the hospitalities of this most hospitable people. Just think of the dinners, suppers, breakfasts we have been to. People have no variety in war times, but they make up for that lack in exquisite cooking. Variety, said he. You are hard to please, with terrapin stew, gumbo, fish, oysters in every shape, game and wine, as good as wine ever is. I do not mention juleps, claret cup, apple toddy, whiskey punches, and all that. I tell you, it is good enough for me. Variety would spoil it. Such hams as these Virginia people cure. Such homemade bread. There is no such bread in the world. Call yours a cold collation. Yes, I have eggs, butter, hams, game, everything from home. No stint just now. Even fruit. You ought to do your best. They are so generous and hospitable, and so unconscious of any merit or exceptional credit in the matter of hospitality. They are no better than the Columbia people always were to us. So I fired up for my own country. January 23rd. My luncheon was a female affair exclusively. Mrs. Davis came early and found Annie and Tootie making the chocolate. Lawrence had gone south with my husband, so we had only Molly for cook and parlor maid. After the company assembled, we waited and waited. Those girls were making the final arrangements. I made my way to the door, and as I leaned against it, ready to turn the knob, Mrs. Stannard held me like Coleridge's ancient mariner, and told how she had been prevented by a violent attack of cramps from running the blockade, and how providential it all was. All this floated by my ear, for I heard Mary Preston's voice raised in high protest on the other side of the door. "'Stop,' said she. "'Do you mean to take away the whole dish?' If you eat many more of those fried oysters, they will be missed. Heavens, she is running away with a plug, a palpable plug, out of that jelly cake. Later in the afternoon, when it was over and I was safe, for all had gone well and Molly had not disgraced herself before the mistresses of those wonderful Virginia cooks, Mrs. Davis and I went out for a walk. Barney Hayward and Dr. Garnett joined us, the latter bringing the welcome news that Musco Russell's wife had come. January 25th. The President walked home with me from church. I was to dine with Mrs. Davis. He walked so fast I had no breath to talk, so I was a good listener for once. The truth is I am too much afraid of him to say very much in his presence. We had such a nice dinner. After dinner, Hood came for a ride with the President. Mr. Hunter of Virginia walked home with me. 
he made himself utterly agreeable by dwelling on his friendship and admiration of my husband. He said it was high time Mr. Davis should promote him, and that he had told Mr. Davis his opinion on that subject to-day. Tuesday Barney Hayward went with me to the President's reception, and from there to a ball at the McFarlands. Breckinridge alone of the generals went with us. The others went to a supper given by Mr. Clay of Alabama. I had a long talk with Mr. Old, Mr. Benjamin, and Mr. Hunter. These men speak out their thoughts plainly enough. What they said means, we are rattling down hill and nobody to put on the brakes. I wore my black velvet, diamonds, and point lace. They are borrowed for all theatricals, but I wear them whenever they are at home. February 1st. Mrs. Davis gave her luncheons to ladies only on Saturday. Many more persons there than at any of these luncheons which we have gone to before. Gumbo, ducks and olives, chickens in jelly, oysters, lettuce salad, chocolate cream, jelly cake, claret, champagne, etc., were the good things set before us. Today, for a pair of forlorn shoes, I have paid eighty-five dollars. Colonel Ives drew my husband's pay for me. I sent Lawrence for it. Mr. Chestnut ordered him back to us. We needed a manservant here. Colonel Ives wrote that he was amazed I should be willing to trust a darkey with that great bundle of money, but it came safely. Mr. Pettigrew says you take your money to market in the market basket, and bring home what you buy in your pocket book. End of chapter 16, part 3